All right, so let's go ahead and um, we'll get started with our continuing education. Let's go ahead and do intros. Pete Peterson is here. Austin Quinn Davidson. <laughs> John Weddleton is here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Pete Peterson. Here, Felix yes. Rivera. <laughs> That's right. Alex Lipka. I'm Ross Roosevelt. All right, so we have two things on the agenda for today. Mr. Chair, have... I'm also on the line. Oh, oh, hey, yes. Chris. Hey, Chris. <laughs> Um, so we have investments uh, presentation and we have a presentation from purchasing. So we are starting with investments. Well, let Ross do all the talking. Uh, she's going to get the links. Now, um, I made a few minor changes on the hard copy, but I, I didn't get it in the electronic copy because Alex has one we looked at last night. But um, the. Uh, this is for about debt and investments, and that's what public finance division does. It's one division within the finance department. <coughs> um, and uh, what we do in public finance is we manage the debt and investments of the municipality. Most of them. There's a couple exceptions. We don't, uh, the treasurer manages the police and fire retirement system, the MOA trust fund, pre-funding, uh, board and pre-funding medical trust. So that's a little separate from what we do in public finance. Um, there's, on page two, we have a short, uh, that's the agenda there. We have, we have a few things about staff, our core services, debt management, investment management, and we will look at returns on the last page. On page three, <clears throat> we have um, Alex and myself listed here. We're the two leaders in the, the finance department with regard to debt investments. Uh, the point of pa pages three and four is to show clearly that uh, the, the financing of debt and investments in the municipality is managed by a very capable staff. Alex is a seasoned professional, of course, in investments, uh, both outside and here in Alaska for the last 20 <coughs> years. Uh, I've been with uh, the municipality since 2004. Uh, previously, I served uh, at Alaska Highland and For Finance Corporation in a similar capacity uh, for 14 years. And on page four, there's five staff members that report to me, um, and they're all very capable people. They've got a lot of investment experience. They've got a broad array of experience um, in public, public finance as well as the private sector. Uh, together, these seven people have uh, 187 years of experience. Well, I was looking at your guys, and I thought 37 was pretty impressive, and then I saw 36, so you're really, that's We're a lot of years. Both old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's older than Felix. <laughs> Thanks. That's hard to do, but yeah. <laughs> the, public, the world of public finance is, um, is def a little different than corporate finance. Yeah, public finance is where uh, state and local governments uh, have... Uh, Staff members that will that are used to financing debt and managing money in, in financing debt from the public uh, from the <coughs> capital markets and uh, and then also managing debt in separately. Public finance is mainly about debt. So um, what we do in the core services, along with those two lines, is um, we're an internal services organization on page five here, and we build for our services through, um, we'll be, we bill for our services uh, in debt and, and investments. And we, hence that our budget isn't a direct down drop to the uh, annual budget each year, but it actually gets paid by other divisions and uh, departments that need to have debt raised for them and their money invested. So um, we provide management of new and outstanding debt we have a portfolio of two billion dollars of debt that's outstanding, and um, we have a um, investment portfolio that's nearly a billion dollars in September and drops down to four or five hundred million dollars in um, <coughs> the spring of each year, through a uh, based on seasonality of receipt of uh, primarily property taxes. Yes, ma'am. Um, this is a kind of back to when you're talking about staff. Oh, thank you, Desiree. Mm -hmm. Just wondering. Um, how you hire and maintain staff, is it difficult because you can make so much more money in the private sector? Or is this such a special opportunity to manage this level of money that that, or debt, that that's attractive? Or what, what, what compels someone? I mean, in your positions, it makes more sense to me because you know you then 
are in charge of things and you get some exposure or whatever people want. But how, how does that, how is that? So I would say a, a couple things. A, um, the salaries for the work that's being done are fairly competitive. Yes, you can make more in the private sector, but you know, those salary ranges are rare and not a lot of it in Alaska for what you're doing, which is actually underwriting, issuing, and managing debt. And um, having been in the private sector as well as now the public sector, uh, it is actually a easier path to get to actually manage and supervise funds like this to the public sector as opposed to the private, private sector. <coughs> Those jobs are very rare and extraordinary. Mm -hmm. So I would say that you know Ross has Ross has been able to attract and retain uh, very capable staff, uh, and we are <coughs> certainly thrilled with the people that are working there right now. Awesome. Yeah, and, and Alice pointed out a, a very a very key thing: there aren't a lot of opportunities like this in in Alaska, mm -hmm. okay? and th there's very few people in Alaska working in public finance that have basically the experience that I do. Um, I started in 1983 and, uh, um, and had some tier one, so that's one reason why I'm still here. Uh, but uh, there, there aren't a lot of opportunities. <laughs> you mean you love your job. <laughs> right? And that sounds like 36 years, so I'm wondering if you didn't say 37 just to try to one-up Alex. But he is yeah. well, fractionally older. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fact, I'll I, let it get I, back to serious. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good job. Uh, and it's, it's, a great, it's a great opportunity to, to work in this and at the same time be a public servant. Thank you. So, we're we're a we're a uh, uh, sort of a profit center. So we bill for our services, and and we get paid for them. And then we uh, uh, the things that we don't manage, I mentioned earlier, is the MY Trust Fund, and the Police and Fire Retirement Fund, and the Medical Prefunding Investment Fund. So we have uh, recently, in the last few years, we've split off some investments from from the pot of money that we have that we'll talk about soon. But we have a restricted municipal funds, and this is where we take prepaid state and federal grants and some of the and the angel fund money that we receive started with the program to uh, support local startups. And so that money cannot be exposed to loss. So we manage it extremely <coughs> conservatively in a separate fund. Then we have the Anchorage Regional Landfill and the Asset Retirement Obligation Investment Boards and their investment funds managed by a board. So we split off those two dollar amounts for the Anchorage Regional Landfill. So we've got a set of money, uh, we've set aside some money that will be used to close and take care of post-closure requirements of the landfill when we start doing that. The asset retirement obligation is related to the Beluga River gas field, which is owned in part uh, largely by MLNP. And that has a, um, it's called, uh, I forget the, the, the buzz word for it, but you have to take down the, the, the equipment and make it go back to close to nature, maybe not exactly the way nature was, but I use the example of uh, if you have a rig standing up, you probably have to take the rig down, uh, but then maybe the cement pad just stays there. So there's that kind of stuff that's uh, EPA and, and DEC uh, stuff that's regulated by the feds and the state. And so there's an investment fund uh, that we've set up for that. Um, all the capital financing needs of the municipality are managed by public finance under the CFO, guidance of the CFO. Public finance manages the municipality's debt portfolio and voter authorized but not yet issued debt. So general obligation debt is what the voters vote on each April when we present them with a bond ballot proposition. And there might be a half a dozen or more each April. The school district has uh, a separate <coughs> ballot proposition, usually one or two, and the municipality has um, anywhere from two to five or six of them. Now, the, uh, the reason that there's um, more than one, the school district is just for schools, although it's a general obligation of the municipality. The other ones come 
you, there might be a half a dozen or so, but they're based on service areas. So the taxes are, so the, the service areas are taxed for those particular um, debt issues, like Anchorage Roads and Service Drainage Area, ARTSA, that's most of Anchorage, but not all of Anchorage. So it's not called area-wide. And then there's some propositions that might be area-wide where all the taxpayers um, participate in. The, the unique thing about that is, um, if it's ARTSA, the, the clerk, ha during the election and the voting, the clerk has to track the voting in the ARTSA service area, as well as the area-wide service area, and it has to pass in both service areas for it to become uh, uh, voter authorized. So we met, with the investment portfolio, we, and most of it is in what we call the municipal cash pool. Generally speaking, we call it the general cash pool, the GCP, but the lion's share of the money is what we call the municipal cash pool, and that has a seasonal swing of uh, perhaps as low as four or $500 million in April or May of each year, and to a seasonal high of uh, well, nearly a billion dollars in September. I think it was $950 million in September, this past September, yesterday. I, you know, I, I, I'm not uh, noting some questions as you've gone along. I mean, you don't have a lot of pages. You want to wait till the end and then go back? Or you can ask as you go. Sure. Yeah. Does that work better? Yeah. Is that okay? Um, yeah, go for it. I just, so starting at the top of Core Services, page five. Sorry about um, so, so what you're saying is IGCs are all over the place for you guys? So, so it's two things. One, a lot of this is IGC, not the other departments. But the other thing is that the department itself actually charges a nine basis point fee on the funds that it manages. And those, that fee goes to help support the budget of the public finance department. Right. And, and, and with regard to IGCs, because we bill for our services, we, public finance, doesn't IGC anybody. We only bill for it, or but we get we get IGC, believe me. But we don't IGC up, and so we just bill for our services. So when we when we um, sell general obligation debt for the school district or for general government, we finance that fee, our fee as part of that. Okay, that that um, nine basis points is part of that. Well, on, that or is on, that the, a on the investment side, it's nine basis points. Okay. It's, that's, a separate, that's a separate fee for investing money. That's nine basis points. And so what we do is um, we calculate our, calculate our earnings every month. So we take the gross earnings, and then we take nine basis points off the top for public finance. And then, then we allocate the rest of the earnings to the equity owners of the cash flow. And then when we sell debt, we sell debt based on nine basis points, again, for general obligation debt. And then if we sell revenue debt, like for uh, the water utility, the wastewater utility, or MLMP, we charge thir uh, 13 basis points. Revenue bonds and are more labor intensive. And so we really get, so we're, we're charging that fee and we're getting it up front. And we have to maintain that general obligation bond issue and uh, administer it for 20 years and we're getting paid one time up front for it and it actually is the these fees actually have it's it's been surprising to me how these fees we came these I, I inherited some of these fees when I came here and then we we've had one increase and we raised them from eight basis points to nine we raised it from 12 basis points to 13 and it actually matches our budget and our, our budget is really pretty well matched and so if we have extra money uh, that carry, we carry it over in our fund balance for the, for the next year. So if there's not quite as much activity on the selling side of debt perhaps, we may not have as much revenue. So if for some, if we were underneath our expenditures, we'd have that amount that we carry forward available to us. Why would you have extra money though? Pardon if me? you bill for your services, why would you have extra money? Pardon me? We, if you we, have, if you bill for your services, why would you ever have extra money? Because don't you just bill for what you do? Well, we bill for what yes, we bill for what we do, and but then we the, our expenditures primarily are um, uh, professional service fees for our staff, um, in, uh, payroll basically, and so that's that's a fixed 
that's kind of a fixed uh, expenditure for, for the division. Mm -hmm. And then the variable is how much money we have to invest. Okay, that's a variable, and we charge nine basis points on the market value of that variable. And then the, the other variable is on okay. the debt side, how much debt do we issue? We, well, if we issue nine, if we issue, if we don't issue any general obligation debt this particular year, then we don't have that revenue. Got it. Okay. And then the next year, if we miss a year for general obligation debt, which occasionally we do, we generally go to the marketplace for general obligation debt every year. But four years ago and maybe eight years ago, we just missed that year just because we just didn't need the money quite yet. And then the next year we, we issued a little more extra because it's not even, it's not even. so then we might have a little extra on the fee side. Got it, got it. Yeah. So it's not excess fees, it's just um, the, fee, the, the fee income is a little more, not quite as even. Yeah, as it's not like an hourly rate, it's based on the yeah. okay, that makes sense. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, so I, I think in, in my head, IGCs are one department billing another, so, so you must be mechanically a little different, but isn't that IGCs is essentially that allocating those costs is like billing, yes, like but, IT well, I guess what does through saying, IGCs. So for so. example, the controllers division mm -hmm. does all the accounting, so every, their entire budget is igc out to everybody. Right. As Ross is saying, we're very specifically you know, charging for the services of issuing debt and managing the money. Yeah. So if we're not issuing any debt for you, like your Merrill Field, right. we're not going to so, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Okay, that's a neat distinction. So, can I? Uh, wait, can I ask about that? So, wait, isn't that how IGC works? So, when you do I, something, you charge for it? So, IGCs, and, and Lance huh. can speak about this more generally, but they aggregate all of the internal services costs, and it's somewhere in the 20 to 30 million dollar uh, total for general government. And then that gets charged out to all the enterprises and everybody else <coughs> that uses those services, which is different from what we're doing because public finance is only charging for its actual service to you when you needed to borrow some money for service to you because you have a hundred million dollars in the cash pool and we're managing it. Hmm. Thanks, John. Yeah, um, I was thinking about the landfill. So we have a fund where we're putting money into there for closure buy a new place is that in it's there? for closure but just for closure just for closure. yeah so closure and post post closure care right? well, for long term yeah so because okay. after you close it you have to maintain right. it for okay so many years. Um, you made some assumptions like it'll close in we have he's got a clock 33 years and two months and six hours or something um, so you're based on that but we're doing a lot of things have a huge amount of money into things that will lengthen that perhaps substantially <coughs> if we did waste and energy you wouldn't be extended a thousand years or something. Correct. Do you, um, do you adjust your... So we're actually going to be meeting that? next week um, on that exact same topic. Right now the landfill fund is fully funded and so we're going to be examining exactly what statute allows us to do. Should we be fully funded now um, or should we... Uh, we're, we're going to examine that stream of revenue because you're correct. If we do in fact institute waste to energy, that's going to change that number quite substantially. When you say fully funded, we have the amount we need now to close it and maintain it? Or so it's, a, an it's, a, it's an asset liability study, so we'll say that it's going to close in 30 years, right? So we happen to have, I think, somewhere around 32 million. In 30 years, that would be worth 90 or 100 million, because that's what we think the, the liability is going to be discounted back to the president. Okay. That's important because we've raised the rates for solid waste services substantially. And if we can cut their contributions to that, maybe we can mitigate some of that. The, and it's important to understand that those rate increases are doing two things. One, they're catching up, obviously, with Pat Tooth where they didn't. And, and most of those rate increases is going to support a debt service coverage ratio because they're going to spend somewhere around 100 million to replace the transfer station. And right. so they need those uh, rate increases in order to be able to borrow the money right. to finance that. So look at long term though, like, I mean this landfill thing is a long term thing. So like three years from now, maybe we only raise our rates two and a half percent or something. That, that could be you know. So, um, and, and then a question on this, you say a low point on the municipal <coughs> cash flow of 500 million. It seems like I've seen it recently, 
three hundred or something. And some of those reports we get, still a lot of money, but substantially less. Yeah, and, and on that that report that you're looking, that quarterly report that we've been sending out, that's the municipal cash pool, right? Okay, and that's where the lion's share of money is. Property taxes go into the municipal cash pool. Now there are other pots of money that I included in that bottom of that, that bottom line there that include that includes the ARL fund, the ARO fund, the RMF fund. It includes money that's at key bank uh, for liquidity purposes, that sort of thing. So so it's a it's not the municipal cash pool is not all inclusive. The general cash pool is all <coughs> inclusive. Okay, can I have one more? So we do <coughs> May June or something like that. We do tax anticipation notes, right? And because the property taxes haven't come in yet, but we need that money to keep the city going. But isn't that what the municipal cash pool is? Why don't we just pull money out of that? So it's the dead. point of that is, and is if you remember that 12 years ago, we did a study on the municipal cash pool, and we realized that there was some money that we actually never touch. So we segregated that money into three pots, middle to long term, mid term, and very short term. And all the tax revenue goes in and out of the short term fund, which can vary from you know, 50 million to 500 million when taxes come in and out. Um, we do the tax anticipation notes, and we generally do those in January and February for one very simple reason. So we do not have to sell anything out of the cash pool, which would both incur transaction costs and would as well decrease our ability to earn a higher rate of return by having this money in long term money. So we're, we borrow it for a year at very low rates. And as an example, it's anticipated that the tax anticipation note that we did this year was beneficial to the tune of about $1.6 million of additional income that we would have not otherwise received if we had actually drawn down the cash flow. But, but, so we have it broken into three, and one is short term. I mean, right. again, you got that treasuries or something paying yes. zero. Well, there it's actually over one percent now. Is that right? No, be. So, um, and, and, you're, and we want to draw from the other two, but that is somewhat available for immediate needs. And is that not an? Is that so too little? So, if without the tax anticipation notes, that fund would go to zero or below zero. Okay, because it, it, that's so thin. Well, it's it's, it's not enough. It's, it's designed. You know, the cash flow is designed to, to maximize income. So we are going to run it so that the, the amount that has the least amount of yield has the least amount of money in it without yeah, yeah. jeopardizing our ability okay. to. So, so you've worked in the TANS will be an annual thing just for the broad. So we really should look at municipal cash flow earnings, TANS. Correct. As a group. Okay. Yeah. And, and as Alex pointed out, that. that the working cap, the short term money, the working capital portfolio, that would be depleted and we would have to go into the contingency right. portfolio, the next one up, pull money out that's invested long. Yeah. So it sounds like you're spending money when you issue tax anticipation notes because you are, but remember it's short term money, nine to 12, nine to 12 months of, of, a, of a debt instrument when we're, and we compare that to the long term investments that we have in the other two portfolio, the two portfolios that are longer term and and a lot of times we're making money, as Alex pointed out. Well, it's good, thank you. So it's a good thing. All right, I have a couple other questions. Uh, Pete. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I wanted to go back to the landfill a little bit. You said we have $32 million in that account right now. Uh, we're talking about uh, building a, a new transfer station and going to uh, uh, crew, you know, generate electricity, possibly. So would, you, would we be able to borrow from that fund uh, since we're going to extend the life of the landfill another 100 years or 50 years or whatever it is? We're going to explore that conversation next week to understand, A, what does the statute allow us to do, uh, and B, when things do change. So if we implement a new transfer station which has higher rates of recyclability, lower rates of use of the landfill, and obviously if we go for waste energy, which would substantially extend the life of the landfill, that will also enter into the calculation of, you know, if we are well overfunded, we would definitely explore how we could possibly use that money currently, as John said, to maybe not have to raise rates as high as we might otherwise need, if in fact 
the liability gets reduced substantially. And one other question on a different subject now. Uh, Robin Ward's real estate department, do, you, do they manage their, their own uh, funds or is that, do your department handle that as well? The, the, cat, the, the, the money and the investments, that's all public in public finance. It's all public finance. Yes, yep. and uh, it's you know obviously it's the accountants account for it, and we're you know it's fund based accounting, uh, so uh, the real estate services has a you know if they have a million dollars in their fund we track that they get earnings on it etc. Same with the school district, the CFO is responsible for all funds in this municipality including the school district, so the school district has um, a large portion of the general of the municipal cash flow that we talk about, so they they own actually about twenty five percent of it. Uh, general government owns about 75% of it, and then ACDA owns about a little less than 1% of it, so they have their money in it as well. Now, each of them, the, the school district uh, and the general government, we both bank at Key Bank, so there's funds on deposit there for liquidity purposes and maybe some other things. Uh, if they have a checking account for this or that, they might keep some separate funds separate. Um, and so when I'm talking about uh, these giant numbers, I'm talking about everything all together on the investment side and on the debt side, and then we'll get into a little more detail here in the next page or two. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, one more, uh, Suzanne. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Apologies for being late. Um, this is just a general reference question, and we get a lot of reports, and I know there's a lot of information online about the city's finances as well. Is there, what, or what's the best reference document in terms of what funding is available to the city. Um, and I'm thinking of our conversation, Alex, recently about unrestricted fund balance and restricted fund balance and how those you know pieces move, as well as when we borrow money from ourselves, like what we did with the stormwater utility. Is there, I mean, where can I go to see like all those different options? I think the best way to understand it is through the budgeting process which we're in right now because the budget describes you know how much we can spend and really it's the function of the uh, public finance department to follow through on those instructions and so it's clearly delineated obviously if the public votes for debt we issue the debt and there's cash sitting on the balance sheet we manage it um, items about you know, whether it's AWU or MLP, and do they need additional money to borrow money to, to manage their budget? Um, we support them in that manner. Um, the idea behind the unrestricted fund balance, it, it, it really, that calculation, which is done once a year, together with the budgeting process, kind of describes, you know, what's available to be spent, which is why the budget discussions are so important, because I think as Lance has detailed it, you know, we're going to run through the end of this year most likely underneath our fund balance policy of having 12% unrestricted. Um, and the rating agencies look at that very closely to see, well, are you in permanent financial difficulties or were these just one-time things for the Henry settlement, which we'll be able to tax for, uh, whether this is um, temporary underfunding due to earthquake reimbursement from FEMA. Uh, those are the two things. The bigger thing which may concern them more is the fire department budget. I mean, is, that, is that a permanent thing? And, and what are we going to do across the entire municipality to balance our budget in order to accommodate those expenses? So I would say if you look at the budget process and very specifically look at the, I think you get the information from OMB on how we calculate the right. tax cap. I mean, that's, I think, the best way to understand, you know, yeah. what monies are available. Um, but the reality is that, you know, there are things we can do if we need to. And for example, for stormwater, it's something that want, we wanted to get funded. There was no other source of funding except to go mm -hmm. borrow the money. Um, those are, uh, I would say, individual items and they're generally very small in the scheme of things. Mm -hmm. you know, we're borrowing one and a half million on a budget of a billion dollars with two billion in debt. Mm -hmm. so that kind of describes the scale of what's possible. Um, 
the uh, waste to energy project. You know, what you're next going to see is a, a model, and is that model going to be able to support the roughly $350 million cost? And so that's like everything we start with. If there's revenue to help support debt, then we can finance it. But these are the discussions we're having relative to the port. How much do we have to raise their revenue in order to support mm -hmm. debt needed to meet capital expenditures? Thanks, and a quick follow-up, I guess, is um, sometimes, just in talking with members of the public, there's a little bit of confusion as to when do we bond for something, when do we put it to the voters versus when do we just borrow? Um, and you know how the city makes the decision as to pursue one option of financing versus another. I think it's driven by the code. I mean, we uh, we're, we go to the voters because we're required to in order to make certain expenditures. Um, I think it's, it's the same way when we think about how did we finance uh, SAP. Right? That's exactly what I was thinking. Of. Right. So because it comes up, why didn't we have to vote on the eighty million dollars? and we vote in these smaller projects? Because what happened is the assembly at the time approved right. the budget, and the budget included X amount of money. How did, how did we use that budget? So, you know, when you gave us a budget of $7 million a year for SAP, you know, what we chose to do is to borrow X in order to be able to spend that money, as opposed to um, just actually spending cash. And if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, the, uh, we, you don't finance operating expenses. Right. You finance capital expenditures. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's, uh, that's, that's part of the, the difference here. And so, and, no, I'm sorry, the, uh, the other thing I wanted to say is um, we go to the voters for general obligation debt. They have to pass that because what that means is we're pledging the municipality's ability to tax for it, okay? So they have to vote on that. Now for revenue bonds, which is like for municipal light and power, water utility, wastewater utility, stormwater utility, or any of these utilities, those revenue debt. So we don't have to go to the voters for revenue debt because that's not based on taxes. That's based on a stream of, of revenue from the users of those respective utilities. That's the difference between revenue debt and general obligation debt. <clears throat> so you want to go to page six, that would be good. I'm sorry, I'm going to delve into that a bit. So we have um, Denina Corn. Center, 12% for bed tax. 4% goes to Denina. Is that counted as a revenue tax? That is a revenue tax. That's a revenue tax. That did not have to go to vote. Did Part of that go? Would the 4% um, increase in it? Yeah. I, so, uh, I, I would you repeat the question, please? Uh, um, the, thinking about the Denina Center and the 12% bed tax of 4% is committed to the Denina. Yes, yes. So, was, and I'm just saying, is that a revenue tax? That's, that's a that, revenue, that that's a revenue tax. And that didn't go to the voters. I mean, we did go but to that the That much of the voters. Why, why? It's a tax. Anytime you tax, anytime you tax, the municipality, we are required to go to the voters. So if we wanted to increase that tax from 12 to 14 percent, <coughs> get an extra 2 percent of revenue, which would be unrestricted revenue, we'd have to go to the voters. So again, the tax was 8 percent up until January 1st of 2006. And in 05, I think, we went to the voters and they said, we'd like to build a convention center, bring more people to the town, help grow things, and uh, we'll pay for it with the bed tax. So it went from 8 percent to 12 percent. At the time, the national average was 14% for bed tax across the country. So we were kind of underneath it, um, still by going up to 12. And that 4% is dedicated solely for the, the con what we call the convention centers, which is both the Egan and the Demand. Right. So, so, so it's a revenue, it's, it is a revenue tax as opposed to tariffs at the port or trash fees at the solid waste services. So solid waste services can do a bond based on their revenues, and that right. doesn't go to the voters. Correct. But this is a revenue tax. This is, uh, because it was specifically funded by a tax as yeah. opposed to by operating revenues. And it became part of a revenue bond transaction, as I described earlier, because the, the bonds we sold to build the Denina Center, like almost $100 million, um, 
they're supported only by the revenue stream of that particular tax. So there's a little crossover in, in that particular bond issue, but where the revenue stream is a tax, whereas MLMP, the, the ratepayers pay rates. And that's a revenue, that's revenue, and that's hence the revenue bond. Debt management. Debt management on page six. So we talk a little bit specific, more specifically about debt management. Um, as I mentioned, the, in aggregate, the municipality has nearly $2 billion in debt outstanding, approximately. About $1.6 billion is uh, general obligation debt. And so if you add up all the other stuff, the revenue bond debt, and some of the master lease, the master lease program and the short-term borrowing programs that we have here and there, you get up to about over $2 billion. Right now, the municipality has $219 million of authorized debt that has not yet been issued, authorized by the voters, going back three, four years, one, two, three years, something like that. So when once we once the voters authorize that debt, we don't immediately sell the debt. We only sell it when we need to sell it. And there's a split there. A general purpose has $106 million, schools has $113 million of authorized but not yet issued debt. So we could issue $219 million of debt now because the voters have asked us to do that. We always take it to the assembly for approval when we do that. Got a question for you, Meg? Thank you. Um, <coughs> does that debt have a sunset at any point if we don't use it by a certain time? Do we it does not it? sunset. Never, never, ever. It does not sunset because the voters told us to issue it. Hmm. Or that you could issue it. Correct. Permission. Yes. Permission to issue. Right. Yes. Do we know what our, our oldest or how our oldest amount of debt in there is, or when that the we do. Last I don't. I, okay. I don't have it by memory, but we actually have a nice little grid in the chart. Every bond balance proposition, we track it. So if we if ARTSA this past uh, this past April, if ARTSA was like thirty five million dollars bond proposition that passed, um, we'll issue that. $35 million, we may take two, three, four years to issue that. <coughs> I'd love to see that chart, especially if we're we talking about can. new potential bonds. Yep, it's, a, it's okay, an important great. chart. Thank you. It, it, uh, and I asked this question too, because the question is when you see unissued debt outstanding, uh, can we just like skip a year and not <coughs> issue any debt at all or not ask for any debt issuance? And, and, and the way uh, these projects work, because they're capital projects, they need to be design that in some years you know you're going to be spending money on design next year you're going to be spending some money on initial construction and so it, it doesn't always get spread out over time I believe the last time I looked at it the oldest outstanding but unissued was somewhere about 2013 or 2014 Great. thank you and the school district um, has a list online of their capital projects and funding sources and debt year because that had come up how much they have that wasn't triggered and I know it's available for the public on their site. Okay, uh, back on page six. In, in 2005, we brought on a company called uh, Hilltop Securities, formerly First Southwest Company, and what we did was we reevaluated everything that we do uh, in uh, with regard to debt issuance and debt management. And we do this routinely with our financial advisor to make sure that we are <coughs> seeing best practices when it comes to uh, debt issuance for the municipality. Uh, financial advisors, a New York-based firm, uh, they're competitive. They, they responded competitively to an RFP over the past couple, of, past many years. They've uh, been successful a couple more than once uh, in that RFP process, and they've been a great help to us in the, a lot of capacities, not just debt issuance, but uh, also with uh, 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 expert testimony for RCA rate case hearings for light and electric utilities, uh, both AWW and MLMP. So they bring a lot of uh, value and expertise to us. They see what's going on across the globe and the country and what other clients of theirs are doing, and that's also helpful. Um, one of the things that we have done uh, starting back in 2008 was we started a short-term short-term borrowing programs 
Um, in 2008, we started a commercial paper program for the port of Alaska. At that time, it was the port of Anchorage. And it's a short-term borrowing program. This commercial paper program is, uh, you've heard about that. We can issue tax exempt commercial paper. We've also got short-term borrowing programs with commercial banks. And what, we, what it is primarily a good thing for is to finance the beginning process of capital projects, where you borrow um, for three or four years, and you get up to a critical amount, and then you refund that short-term borrowing debt with long-term revenue bonds. That's typically what we use it for. And the $40 million that's outstanding for the port, it only has uh, one debt outstanding. It's a short-term borrowing program. It's a direct uh, loan agreement, a direct placement with a commercial bank that was competitively sought out as well. And that's $40 million. And that's been in a short-term mode since 2008. And basically, um, if that was in long-term revenue bonds, the difference between long-term revenue bonds and the short-term borrowing program is like $1.2 million savings every year for the port because um, of the short-term nature of the debt. Now, they're not paying down any principal, they're just paying interest, but the difference in the, inter the in interest is about $1.2 million. Now, you can um, supersize that with MLMP. They have $192 million outstanding in short-term debt. Now, were it not for this, the anticipated sale of MLMP, we would already have refunded that into long-term revenue bonds. But because of the sale, we're leaving the debt uh, status of MLMP just as it is until we consummate a sale. So that's the that's the nature of the short-term borrowing programs. Um, I would add, and please. what you saw yeah. relative to the proposals for the port, what you're going to see coming forth from the port commission, is that after 12 years of having that not paying any principal down, um, we are going to start paying principal down on that $40 million note. So that is starting to contribute to you know the increases that are going to be needed uh, at port tariffs. Is that we're no longer just going to let them float $40 million forever. Um, we're going to start paying it off. Fred, yeah, and thank you. I apologize slightly for being late. <laughs> Very well said, <laughs> but. <laughs> no, not totally. Pardon? Yeah, it's over. Uh, back a few decades when I worked in the oil industry, uh, and their managers would call every department head on Friday and say, where are you at on your committed funds? And they would be investing that over the weekend and make significant but am I right in assuming that our short-term uh, investment isn't that short? Um, well, that, we're on the debt page right now. Yeah, no. But I'm, you're talking about investments, which yes. is perfectly fine. Yeah, forgive me for being out of order. No, that's Go ahead. Say. But on the on investment yeah. side, of the, yes. yeah, we we have. Um, um, if if we want to skip ahead to the next page, well, no, you can, well, go ahead. Or you wait. I, Pardon me for being out of order. No, that, that's. Uh, Let's get ahead because we're running out of time. Yeah. I'll, I'll just I'll cap off uh, page six. We have what we call an intermediate term borrowing program. An <coughs> intermediate term or a medium term is like five, 10, 12 years. And so we set up a program for the water utility and the wastewater utility. They wanted to amortize some of their debt a little faster than 30 years. So we said, well, let's set you up for a 10 year program. And they borrowed $10 million and they amortized it over 10 years. Uh, and the other utility borrowed $20 million, and, they borrowed, and we're going to amortize that over 10 years. So it was a little, uh, uh, it was a little unique to do that, but it was uh, uh, good because they wanted to amortize some of their debt a little faster. And we also kept the program in a variable rate mode that now, after one year, we can convert it to a fixed rate if we wanted to. If rates were to do something dramatic, we could convert it to uh, a fixed rate of income or fixed rate of debt. But We've left it there, and it's, and it's again that ten million and twenty million dollars being invested or being borrowed short term is is a money saver for those two, two utilities. So the, the the short term, like ten years. I mean, if you're because we'll borrow to buy trucks and stuff like that. I mean, we're not going to do that for thirty years. I mean, are you required to do that for seven to ten? If you're well, vehicles. Um, 
we do for fire truck for Anchorage fire department they go to the bond they go to the voters periodically for uh, big rigs fire trucks and trailers and stuff like that and what we do when we sell the debt when we come and they get a, let's say they get approved for five million dollars and that buys them three long ladder trucks perhaps okay the, the, the useful life of those trucks are probably not 20 years so but what we do when we sell the bonds is we make sure that we have a certain amount of debt amortized in the early years to cover any asset that we're financing in that giant bond issue or that large bond issue for 20 years we make sure that we're amortizing enough to cover the shorter term assets. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Okay. So we go to page uh, seven and we're got a few minutes left here. And so the, the general cash pool is a sum of the municipal, all of the municipalities' investments. And most of it is in the municipal cash pool. The municipal cash pool is comprised of three <coughs> investment portfolios. One is a lot, and, and they're based on duration. One is a longer, longer duration portfolio, one is a, a shorter duration portfolio, and one is a working capital portfolio. Very short term investments. So that's where we go with our money, in and out daily, or you know, three, four times a week, we go in and out of that. If we have, some, if we have revenue that came in, and we put it in the working capital portfolio. If we have, if we have to make payroll on Friday, every other Friday, generally we're taking money out of it, okay? And then periodically we balance those three funds, okay? Those three funds are set up with investment criteria for each respective fund, and they each have a, a separate external money manager. BlackRock manages one portfolio, PNC manages a second portfolio, and a local firm here, Last Permanent Capital Management Corporation, manages our working capital portfolio. So it's nice to have those guys handy locally because they can come over and talk to us anytime, and uh, it works out very well. We've got great relationships with all three of these, but we don't, but the public finance staff doesn't have to worry about the individual investments, which is what I think your question was really yeah. Yeah. And, and or the individual cash value, since all the cash is in one pool, they're yeah. doing exactly what. Yeah, and, and, and I guess a potential conflict in BlackRock also does so apply. And, 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 and can you give us a rough number of what you make? Yeah, off we're of getting those? there. Yep. We're getting there. Here, 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 here. It varies year by year. Okay. Um, so uh, the Investment Advisory Commission, which is the commission that helps manage the MOA Trust Fund, is, is a partner to public finance under code, and we seek their input on uh, a lot of things that we do. And we also have in an independent investment advisor called Callan. Uh, it used to be Callan Associates. I think it's called Callan LLC right now. We uh, we use them and have them uh, as a partner in our uh, investment uh, aura so that we continue to practice best practices for money management. So if we go to page. Wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> Bullet three, yes, sir. the last line. Sure. That, that describes um, when Jeff Sims was CFO 12 years ago, we went to the structure that Ross just described, where we realized that we were not not always getting all the money, and so we invested uh, it in three separate areas, longer term, medium term, and short term. And as we were describing earlier, the reason why we do a tax anticipation note every year is so we don't have to buy and sell in those medium term and long term portfolios and as this describes that over the last 12 years it's added over 70 million dollars of additional income into the municipality which is offset. Okay, I had enough time to figure out over what period of time. 12 years. Yeah. yeah, I thought if you were doing that annually. No. I was really <laughs> impressed and I'm very glad that the chief mayor hired you guys. So in, in 2004 when I came to the municipality the longest investment was 90 days. So Jeff, Jeff said, Ross, let's take a look at this. And we hired RV Coons and Associates to come in and evaluate what should we be doing with our money. Here's the history of how much we've got going back. We, here's how we, how we spend it. And they said, why don't you do, why don't you set this municipal cash pool? And we set it up. Uh, we changed, we brought the code up to date, code dated back to unification, back to the 1970s. 
We brought the code up to date. We started this uh, municipal cash pool, and we implemented it in 2007, just in time for the Great Recession. Hey. And <laughs> and uh, and of course, a lot of money was lost in the Great Recession. But the municipal cash pool had a positive return in 2008 of 0.69%. So it's very, it was very. You can't find a portfolio that had a positive return in 2008 unless it was invested only in U.S. Treasuries. Those portfolios had great returns because everybody fled to quality. Um, so the timing was good to change the code. We got conservative investments in place, and we did have a, a little market to market adjustment down. But by September of 2009, we had recovered everything. So it was it was a total success story. Um, good on you. Here we go. We're going to finish that. So yeah, we're finishing up. If you go to the last page. Um, uh, we yeah, page eight says we invest our money for safety first, liquidity second, return on investment third, and we use the process of this portfolio that uh, Alex has described with uh, long term, medium term, and working capital um, durations. Now. Just coincidentally, we came up with, uh, we looked at the returns of the municipal cash pool. We calculate these returns, uh, we calculate the returns, uh, of course, periodically. Um, the trailing one year return as of June 30th, 2019, for BlackRock was 7.65%, for PNC it was 4.6%, and for Alaska Permanent Capital, it's 2.3%. And you can see how the BlackRock manages a longer portfolio, so typically the longer duration portfolio is going to make more. And then there's a medium term portfolio, which we call a contingency portfolio. They're not going to make quite as much because their, their uh, investment criteria is to be have a pool of money that we might need to rely on if we go through everything in the working capital portfolio, which is managed by Alaska and the Capital Management Corporation. And of course, their, their benchmark is the 90 day treasury. And so, in fact, in all three of these, as you can see, they've beaten their benchmark for the trailing one-year return. Now, just coincidentally, I, we looked at, we look at this all the time, of course, but I looked at the one, the two, the three, and the five-year trailing returns as of June 30th, 2019, and in each case, each of these three managers have beaten their benchmark for all of those returns. So, it's... Sometimes you might see a return for a, a three-month period or a six-month period or a one-year period um, in the quarterly reports that we're delivering, but it's very important to look at the longer tr the longer term. When you're looking at one three one and three your returns, that's where you're really seeing is the manager beating their benchmark. And we pay the managers to beat their benchmark gross of fees. That's how the marketplace pays managers. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Fred. Uh, what does trailing mean? <clears throat> Trailing means that any, <coughs> excuse me, at June 30th, the prior 12 months. Yeah. So well, that's the trailing, back back. trailing one year. Yeah, we were both smart to pick BlackRock one, right? Yes, we were. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so the trailing 12, trailing two years is a trailing, is a prior 24 yeah. months. Yeah. And same with three years. Pete. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure exactly how to ask this question, but there's a certain, certain segment of uh, the public out there that uh, thinks that government shouldn't have money in savings because all that money they think has pretty much come from taxpayers and that uh, we should be spending that money that we have in savings instead of taxing them. And so what would be your response to someone who, who uh, ask a question like that to you? So the answer is that when you figure out how much money do we actually have that is unrestricted, this gets to uh, Suzanne's question about fund balance. We actually only have about 50 odd million dollars of unrestricted money. And that money is there for the very real purpose of uh, maintaining our AAA investment rating so that when we go out to borrow money, so if we're AAA and we are have $2 billion in debt and we don't have that debt reserve and so now we're triple B, uh, we're spending an extra $20 million a year just on interest and debt service. So there are two things that are happening. A, when you're running a billion dollar a year business and you only have $50 million in um, unrestricted cash, you're running it pretty darn efficiently. So the real answer is 
you know, it's like any business. We have assets because we're in the process of managing a business. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, and I might add one more thing: the billion uh, billion dollar debt portfolio or uh, billion dollar investment portfolio. That includes the proceeds of bonds that we sell as well. So in uh, October first, we closed the bond issue. A school district issued. Uh, we we sold um, forty one million dollars for the school district. We sold thirty seven million dollars for the um, general government. So it's seventy million dollars right there that's restricted for those projects that the board is voted on. Good yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. So for certificates of person participation, I think the last time um, we issued one was for MLP, and the thinking or the argument was that we would be able to pay that off, recover that with proceeds. Correct. So that's okay. Correct. Do you foresee us making use of um, cops again in the near future? Uh, yes, probably in about a month. So you right. authorized uh, seven point nine million for that specific uh, COP transaction for MLMP. Uh, we issued last year 3.1 million, 3.9 million? 3.8, I think. 3.8, uh, we're about to exercise the, the second piece for 4.1, as we will, in the course of finishing this transaction, have fully spent all that money, including roughly $2 million in attorney's fees. I mean, mm -hmm. so the answer is yes. And that um, kind of uh, debt is just the same as any other kind of debt. It's no worse or no better if you have a greater you know, percentage of COPS related. So the, the rating agencies look at total debt, including okay. all transactions. And so they're going to look at, and, and so when we have conversations with them, which we do once or twice a year, mm -hmm. we're going to describe both where we are and what our plans are. And so they understand that that this money is going to be issued for this very specific purpose, and and they do pay attention to it. I mean, if we were to all of a sudden go out and borrow um, another billion dollars with the geo, that might raise some questions because mm -hmm. it's going to bring with it added expense. Sure. Thanks. Yeah. The uh, the COPs ish, the COPs offer us a little more flexibility as well. When we sell 10, 20 year uh, general obligation debt for twenty years, first. They get the investor gets ten years of call protection. That has to stay out there for ten years. The seven point nine that Alex is talking about with the COPs that we will have on by the end of the year with the second transaction, I can pay, I can pay that off with thirty days notice. Oh wow! And uh, before Mr. Chairman, I have one takeaway um, to deliver to the clerk is uh, the, off, the chart for authorized not debt issued. I think that's the one takeaway. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much. <coughs> I perceive that you guys are doing a good job. I want you to appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <coughs> okay, Ron, you're up. Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, good morning, folks. Uh, as you know, I'm Ron Haddon, the Purchasing Director, and thank you for this opportunity to come and uh, present a little bit more information uh, than I did last time. Uh, I purposely tried to keep the slides very briefly, very brief, and I'm going to try and not read to you the slides. I will. Uh, uh, this is uh, our agenda for this morning, and I purposely, like I say, wanted to not spend a lot of time be going through things because I'm sure you have questions that you would prefer to 
uh, ask other than me go through uh, a lot of various information. But the first thing I wanted to do was talk about terminology. And thank you for your comment, Mr. Dyson. Uh, because in our uh, line of business, terminology means uh, the world of things. So the key things I want to talk about this morning is an invitation to bid, uh, and then the elements of that invitation to bid. And there are a lot of misconceptions about invitation to bids. A lot of people say low price wins, doesn't matter who the contractor is. Well, that's not totally true. Because before we can award a contract on an invitation to bid, we have to verify a couple of things with the contractor. One, that he is responsive. And by responsive, that's really an administrative term of did he do everything we ask him to do? Did he sign the bid? Did he submit the bid on the forms that we ask him to submit it on? Because if he doesn't do those two things, particularly if bidders don't sign their bids, they're automatically not responsive. And you will be surprised how many bidders do not sign their bid. What are our time constraints? Uh, we have until noon. Yeah, all right, thank you. And so, um, there are two questions on professional services contracts. It's not just price, it's qualification and performance. That's correct. Yeah. I'll get to that when I talk about requests for proposals. All right. So, uh, what uh, what are we are we you required to do in terms of giving a set aside for minority owned businesses, women owned businesses, and stuff, if any? There are no requirements uh, for set asides with any municipal code. With <clears throat> when we have federal funds, depending upon the agency, there may be some DBE requirements that come attached to those uh, funds that we will have to abide by. There's no 8A equivalents. No, stuff. sir. We do not have an 8A. We do not have a set aside program for small businesses. We are encouraged to put our projects out so that small businesses can uh, pro propose or bid on those. And if you look at the demographics of Alaska businesses, it's, I believe it's 96.1 or it's 99.1 percent of Alaska businesses qualify as a small business under SBA rules. They're qualified, but, but you don't have to give them a leg up. That's correct. They yeah. do not. Yeah. And uh, under federal law, we cannot discriminate against workers from somewhere else. That's correct. But is that true on where the companies are based? There's no federal restriction on that, is there? The federal restriction is you cannot give a local bidder's preference. Yep, any, uh, on any basis. On any basis. Yep. Uh, but that's that would only apply to us when we're using federal funds. When we're using bond funds or taxpayer funds, then I do have a local bidder's preference that I apply. Interesting. Glad you have that freedom. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Suzanne? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Haddon, at some point when you go through this, and I apologize again for missing the beginning, could you talk a little bit about the contract that's, um, or the RFP terms that are being negotiated now for the stormwater utility phase two piece, and, and how that's um, proceeding, or just how that fits into this process. Not yes. necessarily right now, but as at some point in your Yes, ma'am, I will. And if I don't remember to do that, please remind me because okay. I would like to talk about that. Thanks. Well, but back to an invitation to bid, one of the things we have to, two of the things that we have to do uh, before we can award that contract is we have to determine, as I stated earlier, that they are responsive. Otherwise, did they sign the bid? Did they do various <coughs> other uh, administrative requirements? Did they get it to us on time, for example? And then do they meet the specifications? And that goes to the responsibility determination. And we have to determine that they are a responsible contractor. And by that, I mean, do they have the technical, financial uh, capabilities to perform the contract? And if we have not done business with a contractor before, even if they are the low bid, we're going to investigate with that contractor. We may ask them to present financial statements, we may ask them to give us samples of previous contracts that are equivalent to that. We will do those type of things before we actually make that responsible determination. So the, uh, 
one of the things on an invitation to bid that we have done in the past is we have required contractors within the specification to demonstrate that they have the correct certifications. For instance, if they're installing a particular type of security cameras, we will ask them, particularly if we specify <coughs> the brand of that security camera, please show us your certification that you're certified by the manufacturer to install those type of cameras. So we will do those types of things at invitation to bid. And if they meet those things, if they are the low price, then they will be the winning contract. <coughs> Mr. Chair? <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you have all the statutory tools you need in order to do your job very well? I believe we do, sir. We have, Thank the code you. is currently written with enough, with enough flexibility. Thank you. We Thank can you. do that. Uh, the other term I wanted to go through was a uh, request for proposal. Uh, it's, some, it's called an RFP. And very simply, the difference between that and an invitation to bid is low price doesn't necessarily win on a request for proposal. Because in an RFP, we will establish uh, requirements for a contractor to submit uh, different information uh, so that we can evaluate them. And that evaluation criteria, thank you, that evaluation criteria will vary based on the RFP specifics itself. Fred? Yeah, sorry. Uh, how deeply do you go to look at the subcontractors that a proposer may be going to use as we might be in his proposal? In a proposal, it will de generally depends on the evaluation criteria. We will, and again, it varies by uh, solicitation. On some solicitations, we have asked them, please list your subcontractors so we can evaluate the technical expertise that you're bringing to the table. Uh, and then that evaluation criteria can be things such as, tell us who your project manager is. That may be X number of points. Tell us which projects you have used that are similar to what we're asking you to propose on. That will be evaluated. Tell us, uh, <coughs> you know, how uh, example would be. You know, have you met your time frames on all that? Yeah, but you do that for the subs when it's appropriate. Yes, we do that for the subs when Thank it you. is appropriate. Thank you. And what will happen is, and the way the RFP process will work is, we will issue the solicitation. We'll define what the contractor is supposed to tell us, and in a format so that all the proposals come back in a similar format. When we receive those proposals, the purchasing department will review the proposals to make sure they are responsive to the criteria that we uh, establish. Then we will turn those proposals over to an evaluation team that has been determined beforehand. That evaluation team ranges between five and seven members, uh, depending upon the dollar value that we anticipate. And those uh, seven members, they will, or five members, they will submit a letter uh, to the purchasing department for me to review and determine if those members are in fact who we really want on the evaluation team. So once we get the proposals in, we turn them over to the evaluation. The evaluation team will then evaluate, do an initial evaluation of the proposals. They will come back to the purchasing department and say, we have evaluated the proposals. Here are, here are our scoring of those proposals. We either want to do one of things, go to oral presentations, or we want to go direct to negotiations. What the purchasing department does, once we get that evaluation, we will look at the scoring to make sure that the scoring is relatively similar for all evaluators. <coughs> for instance, if I get a scoring matrix that comes in and says evaluator A evaluated uh, <coughs> proposer A, and he gave them zero points for their technical ability, and I look at evaluator B, and he gave that same firm 10 points on a zero to 10 point scale, we're gonna say, whoa, wait a minute, something's not right here, and we're gonna send it back to the evaluation chairman and say, wait a minute, you've got a discrepancy in your scoring, you need to either reconcile that scoring or you need to explain to us why such a range in scoring. And a lot of evaluation teams don't like that, to be quite frankly, but 
that's our job. We're going to question that as to why there's such a range of scoring. And then once we have uh, approved the scoring, we will either give the uh, evaluation team authority to negotiate or to conduct a little interviews. Once they've completed negotiations, they will come back and say, purchasing department, we've completed negotiations. Here is our recommended contract. And then depending on the dollar value of that, if it's over $500,000, we're going to come to the assembly and ask you for approval to award that contract. Same thing on an invitation to bid. If it's over $500,000, we're going to come to you and ask for uh, your approval to award that contract. The other terminology I'd like to uh, just... Can I ask questions on that? I think it would apply on this previous page. Um, three, okay. Um, one thing is that um, administrative requirements, you know, so you say you've got to have certain, like for, I know for limited road service areas sometimes, you got to have a certain kind of grade or a certain kind of pickup truck or plow, whatever, <coughs> might have equipment requirements. Um, who, who decides those and do you evaluate those? The department will decide what their requirements are. We're going to look at those to, to see if they make sense. Uh, for instance, we've had some arguments, with, or not arguments, but discussions with uh, some of our departments on, well, why did you specify it had to be a 1985 or newer XYZ truck? Does it really need to be a 1985? Could it be a 75? Does it be, need to be a 2010? We're going to question those if they look unreasonable. So I had a, someone call me who was frustrated with something at Solid Waste Services, and he had been doing some kind of drilling there for a number of years, and then he says, all of a sudden the specs change, and there's no one in Alaska who has the equipment to do what they want. And he said, well, I never was told I wasn't doing a good job. Why the change? And it, the change on that particular one was because we needed, Solid Waste Services needed a contractor that could drill to a certain depth 80 or 90 percent, I've forgotten the exact percentage, a certain depth uh, every time. And so they put that in the spec. And unfortunately, this particular contractor had done work for some of those services in the past, but when they looked at what they had done, he couldn't drill to that. He couldn't demonstrate that he had drilled to that particular depth on 80 or 90 percent of the wells. And that requirement was driven by a federal requirement at least my understanding was, drilled to a certain depth to meet the federal requirements. Okay, so it wasn't so much an equipment thing. He could go get the equipment. It was, you got to be able to do this task. Right, you got to be able to drill. He, he has, uh, a, well, I'm trying to think which drill it was. That thing was Denali. Yeah, I think that so. That was uh, talking about that. But, yeah, Denali's a good drill. You know, I dealt with him when I was on the private side. Good so company. he could have bought different equipment and perhaps gotten the contract. Uh, it was he had the equipment. He just couldn't demonstrate that he had drilled to X number of feet, X percentage of the time. Okay. Good. Thanks. That's uh, I'd rather deal with you know, Ron. I think it was Ron Pitchford at Denali. Good contractor. No issues with it. But when you can't meet the spec, you can't meet the spec. And right. Unfortunately, that's... And even if he had the equipment, he didn't have the history. And that's groundwater monitoring? Yeah, I believe it was certain type of wells they had to drill for the groundwater monitoring. Uh, the other two terms I wanted to go uh, over with you, just so when you see these terms on your assembly memorandums, you've got an appreciation for them. Uh, within SAP, we have two terms that are confusing. We have a, per a term called a purchase order, and then we have one that's called a contract. And a purchase order can be two types of instruments. It can actually be an ordering instrument where we just put on the PO what we're ordered and the terms and conditions are a second page to it. We send that to the vendor. He provides the items on the PO. We pay it. The other item it can be, it can be a payment instrument. And what that is, we will attach a contract terms and conditions to that PO, and the PO establishes a mechanism where AP can make the payment. 
but the PO terms and conditions won't rule. It will be the contract terms and conditions. Okay. Thank you. Um, can you talk to me a little bit, and maybe we'll get into it, about sequencing? Because um, this is where I get really confused. Um, we are asked to approve a contract or a purchase order or something, but we don't see that um, document. And oftentimes we're told they're not done. And so I'm always curious. Like, I don't always know um, where or what everything is that's being approved in terms of funds like what it's actually going toward i have like the big picture but anything more specific not necessarily um so i guess um yeah i'm just trying to get a, a sense of the sequencing a bit better we'll address that in just a moment okay if I may. <coughs> and then the other term within sap that you'll see will be a contract and the way you can differentiate that between the two, if we don't spell it out either by purchase order or contract, is the number that's associated with it. A purchase order will have it begin with the 2019, 2020, the year that the purchase order was awarded, followed by six digits. And the 2019 is your key that that is a purchase order that is fully funded. Uh, that's what we're going to pay off of. And a contract has a 44 to begin with it. And what that does is that just establishes a mechanism of which we can write purchase orders against. And a contract is something that we, ha we have got a general idea of what we're going to buy. For instance, uh, you'll see a lot of, when we come to you, a lot of A&E architect and engineering contracts to where sometimes they're referred to as term contracts, where we know we're going to need architect and engineering services, but we don't know exactly <coughs> which project we're going, to, we're going to do with that. So that will have a 4,400 series against it. Ron, it's something that sort of helped me is purchase orders, because I thought there were only contract level before, but purchase orders are often you go to order a supply, a truck, or Correct. you don't need a contract. Professional services are almost always contracts. What Ron's talking about, if you, let's say we hire a law firm to do a, a citywide environmental <coughs> service, we, an we don't know which department will need them, so it's a different, it could, it would be a purchase order, it would be a contract. And then the way that you would, <coughs> on those type of contracts, you would issue a purchase order against that contract, that purchase order will then define how much is going to be paid, what the scope of services, the, that particular firm is going to perform. That's how these two documents work together. So this is what requires, you know, these are the provisions of code that uh, tell you uh, when I have to come to you for approval. Uh, 720.010 is a portion that tells me I have to use ITBs unless an ITB is not appropriate. And by not appropriate, I mean there are some things that you can buy through an invitation to bid where price is primarily important. And one of the classic examples I like to use is if you're buying milk, does it really matter whether it's Dairy Gold or whether it's uh, <coughs> Safeway's brand or Fred Meyer's brand? Milk is generally milk. Now you're going to define whether you want 2% or 1% or whole milk. Organic. Or organic, uh, <laughs> but you're really concerned on price. What does it cost me to buy a gallon of milk? Whereas if you're buying architect engineering services or legal services, or the other classic example is brain surgery. If you're going to have a surgeon perform brain surgery on, do you want to buy the low price guy? <laughs> Not necessarily. You want the best qualified, and so that's. The classic examples of when you would use invitation to bid or a request for proposal. And again, uh, the code requires coming to the assembly for approval at over 500000 Can I ask a question, please? Yeah. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I've talked with Dee and Quincy about um, what sounds like it's a recurring issue with some janitorial contracts that she was going to speak with you about. Apparently, we use the ITB process for that so we always get the low price janitorial <coughs> provider which then ends up doing a somewhat crappy job and because it's a certain race race to the bottom um, is that a pun? Janitorial crappy job. 
yeah, kind of dirty, crappy job. Um, there's sort of a race to the bottom, and then they do, yeah, a crappy job, and then you, but you have to hire them again, and we're in this sort of cycle. And so I've heard both that it's not effective for the muni because we're constantly dealing with these kind of crappy performers, but then also not good for workers because because of the race to the bottom, they're paying their workers really low wages, and of course, they're often people of color and other people who are vulnerable in our community. And so I talked with Dee about what could we do to change that, and she said, well, we actually have the option, or purchasing does, to either do ITB or to pursue a request for proposal. Request. Am I doing the right thing? Okay. Um, so I'm just wondering if you guys had that conversation. I know you're aware of this issue, and if, if it's possible to try that, the RT. Or RFP for a while and see if that might help. We have, you're correct, custodial has been a problem. Uh, we have started, we have not uh, put it aside. We're starting to look much harder at how we're developing the specifications because if all, if we don't define correctly what we're looking for in the specifications and what qualifications the contractor has to have before they can perform that contract, then we're going to have those issues that mm -hmm. you're talking about. And we have had those issues. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to say that we have, uh, on one of those particular contractors, we terminated them for default because they were not performing. Uh, we have changed the specs some a little bit where we're getting a, and I'll use the term, a different quality of contractor proposing now. It's costing us more, but we're getting better service. So we're looking hard at that, and we're trying to weigh the pros and cons of, of that on them. On custodial, for example. So current, can I follow up? So currently, thanks, Ron. So currently, you're doing, you're still doing ITV, but just increasing the standards yes, that are considered. Okay. If you guys wouldn't mind just keeping me posted on that. Okay. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Meg. Um, thank you. Um, for seal bidding, this may be partly a question, partly a rant. Um, and I apologize, <laughs> but I have a real problem with professional services in particular not being transparent, uh, whether it's legal services or engineering services or the like, like hourly rates and things. I think there's a lot of value to transparency of what things cost, um, except for where maybe there's proprietary information that you wouldn't want to give up. Um, so why or, or what triggers things being sealed because I think it just adds to a level of opaqueness as to what we're actually paying for or why it costs what it costs. It's a very good question and it's somewhat of a difficult answer because determining whether it's a sealed bid or whether it's an RFP is really a subjective call. And we're going to look at what are we buying does it lend itself more to an RFP? And by the way, RFPs are transparent also. Once the award is made, anyone can come in and ask for the contract. We'll give them a copy of the contract to include uh, the pricing schedule, what it is. Because one of the things, at least, that I pride myself in the personal department on is transparency. A contractor wants to come in and he wants a debrief on an RFP, ask us. And within code, we will be more than happy to provide that. If you, people want to see the pricing on invitation to bids, it's posted on our website. Uh, the last 10 years of pricing on an invitation to bids are on the website. It takes a while to load to get all that stuff, but it's all there. Uh, RFPs, we generally don't post the pricing on those. We will post the winning contractor, who that is. Uh, and then if someone wants to come in to look at the contract, we're going to, in general, we'll give the contract we may take a while because we're going to have to review it and talk to the contractor to make sure there's nothing proprietary in there uh, before we release the whole thing. But in general, most of our contracts, we try and structure where there's not proprietary information, where we can be that transparent. Thanks. I don't know if that fully answers your question. Food for thought. Thank you. Fred? Do we have, have we had many cost overruns because of order initiated change orders, particularly on construction type work? I would say most of our uh, increases in contracts are owner, owner requested changes. I know under one of the previous municipal managers, he tracked all of that. 
Um, we have not tracked that under the current list for manager. Bring that up to Bill and say, Bill, is something you might want to start doing. Is it a significant number? <coughs> In my opinion, no, but again, it depends on the contract. So it's not two or five or ten percent of the contract? If, oh, you're talking about in terms of dollar value? Yeah. Yes, some of them can be significant. So it's a classic thing that the owner needs to really watch. Yes, it is. And you can have fairly unsophisticated people saying, we got to have this. And, and I, yeah. No, you, you've hit a, a sensitive nerve on my part because I get concerned when I start seeing change orders, particularly when I see a number of them and they're over, over cost. Okay. Now, yeah. if they're changed site condition, different story, and we yeah. run into those. Yeah, so that gets, you got to do better design at the front part, specify. Yes, you do. Thank you. I got Great. the message, I'll speak to the manager. <laughs> <laughs> Chris? Yeah, thank you. On the same topic, uh, the ITB versus the RFP. Um, I, I heard recently some people raise concerns that if you add any kind of responsibility uh, criterion to the front of an ITB, you're effectively creating it as an RFP. What are your thoughts on that, Ron? I don't think you'd be creating an RFP. You're creating a, an additional uh, requirement to make a determine a responsibility determination, Chris. Uh, I don't think you. I don't. By doing that, I don't think you get into the realms of an RFP. Right. So okay, I agree with you that it doesn't in some way because you're saying you have to meet a minimum standard to flip into the RFP status. Well, and there are standards, right, for ITB. So it's just adding another. Yeah, it's it's needs. adding an additional. Totally typical. Yeah. Your, All right. Thank you. Thank you. Deep? Yeah, I just would say that for change orders too, uh, there are certain ones that have to come to you so there's a certain amount, you know, a million dollar contract and it gets 120% or they go 20% over. Hmm. So you'll see your bigger change orders coming to you. Um, so the smaller contract is a fairly small amount. Uh, and also to crit, uh, to make the sealed bidding is also to, to uh, ensure competitiveness and you don't have collusive bidding and uh, everybody has a fair. Um, the actual vendors have a fair playing field as well. Um, because they knew the prices ahead of time. Uh, uh, we have a couple uh, industries that are uh, just notorious for that. Just, excuse me on that subject. Mm -hmm. When those come before us, are they clearly indicating that it's a change order? Is that on what we see? Yes, it is. It'll either say change order number or such and such. Too. Oh, and that's yeah. what, yeah, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and so, if if we have a contractor who's we've used a time or two, and they've come back to us with change orders on several occasions, then the next time they bid, that's something you're going to take into consideration when you decide to give give them that bid or not or, or not. It, it can be a factor in that, but it will be, it will depend a lot on how well the department has administered the contract and how well they have documented those changes in the contract. Those change orders are owner initiated, not the contractor. Yeah, some Excuse me. Yeah. Yes, we have to differentiate between whether change order is owner initiated or whether it's a change site condition. What's the owner? Or maybe a result of it. Yes. Well, we're the owner. Yeah, yeah. Yes, we are the, the, the muni. Kind of yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Suzanne? Um, thanks, Mr. Chair. Actually, this might be a good time to ask more about the, um, the stormwater utility RFP, oh. if that's okay. Yes, and, um, and I understand it was an RFP, it's the one for the phase two, and um, there was no not to exceed amount, of course, listed because it's based on factors other than price. However, it, I mean, it's pretty clear, I think, from, I mean, given how all the discussions about appropriations, everything is public, that 1.5 million is the initial upper limit for you know, what we might be able to spend, even though 600,000 of that is somewhat um, 
earmarked to cover the two FTP for AWU to support it, and I think another couple hundred thousand for legal, and then a couple hundred thousand for additional um, public outreach. So it's expected to be about 500,000. But it, it feels like this puts the, and I, and I understand it's driven by the code and requirements, but it just feels like we're kind of in the dark or we're a little bit of a disadvantage when, you know, bidders know what the resources are and we're waiting on that negotiation. I don't know, can you comment on that piece of it? Um, on this specific RFP, well, when we put that out, we put that out with uh, anticipated scope of work and what we uh, thought the level of, level of effort might be in those elements of scope of work. And what's transpired with that RFP, uh, the proposals came in, they were evaluated, the, uh, the AWO came back and said, here's our number one ranked firm, we would like uh, your authority to enter negotiations. I said, yes, go ahead and enter negotiations. So they start negotiations. And then as a result, those negotiations are ongoing and they're changing based on changes that the assembly body is making to the requirements for that particular service. So what we anticipate originally as an anticipated dollar about may have been increased because of additional requirements levy that are being levied on the contractor and are trying to be negotiated into the contract now. And I know they are a couple of weeks away from at least uh, st starting and finalizing the price negotiations because through an RFP process, when we turn the RFP over to the department for, ne for negotiations, they can ask purchasing to be part of that negotiation or they can say, no, we want to do it. Uh, and in this case, they will have said purchasing, we want you involved in the pricing negotiations. When we get to that point, we're going to ask you to come and be involved. So we will be a lot more intimately involved in the price negotiations than in some of our other RFPs. Now, when we get a contract back, that doesn't mean we just blindly accept what the department has negotiated. Uh, I've kicked, uh, I don't know how many RFPs back because they've come in and said, hey, uh, we want a cost plus X percentage on this particular type of fees. And I said, no. For instance, I'm not going to pay cost plus on any travel or per diem that you have to incur. I've just said flat, no, I'm not doing that. Uh, so we, are, we do review those uh, prices. And at this one, uh, we will be involved much more intimately in the pricing. Quick follow-up. And just when you mentioned um, requests for or feedback from the assembly, increasing the cost, I assume you're specifically talking about like the public outreach component? Yeah, that's part of it because we did not envision the amount of public outreach that was probably appropriate. Okay. Uh, we took a guess at it, or when I say we, sure. AWU, the municipality, we took a guess at what the public involvement would be, and it was, it has told me, it's in front, we probably blew it on public involvement. We probably needed more. So. Thanks. John? Um, are we done with that? I'm just, we oh, done yeah, with, good. Okay. Um, so, again, back, we have a, is it like a 5% local preference for, if it's federal money, we can. If we have a local bidder's preference, and it varies by dollar value, it's up to $20,000 based on the dollar. Oh, value. that's the max. Okay, so we had a discussion where we did this 1% for art thing on Tuesday, and someone said, do you have a local, does that apply to 1% um, for art projects? Um, no. Within the 1% for art program, it's a little bit separate <coughs> than mine. It's, it's within the code, but they run that, and the 1% for art program, uh, they can establish in their criteria whether it's only local artists that can bid or whether they want to go national that's based because the way the 1% for our program works is uh, they bring together a, num a number of community members that want to be on the one on that evaluation committee and then that evaluation committee in conjunction with the 1% for our director determines what the criteria for uh, responding to their it's uh, advertising a different uh, medium than 
that line? Can they make that determination? Can follow up slightly. So uh, if we do a road project financed by federal funds, then they can't. There, there are some restricted then. Then, then they would not be able to establish a, a I'll call it a local bidder's preference because federal funds would. But again, we have, we have, you have to look at what are the ex exact terminology within that grant that the feds give us because some grants have different requirements than others and you really have to dig into the grant. So the question is, it's, you're not in that loop. It would depend on that. Well, the only reason I know that the extent of that is I was involved with the 1% for Archibald Library. So I got to be intimately involved with the evaluation of it. So, and uh, my understanding is if an assembly member, I think if you wanted to be on that evaluation committee, you could because it's open to the public. It's, you know, certain positions on it are, de are defined, but in general then it's uh, open to the public. And I know we've had other, on the committee that I was in, we had some municipal members, we had some public members. Which one of us has to be done? It's a pretty grueling, it can be a pretty grueling process. I mean, we had, and I'm getting off topic, but I apologize. But we had, I want to say, 75 proposals for the uh, uh, library 1% for art. Mm -hmm. it, it was a unique <coughs> experience. I enjoyed it, it was a lot of work. Thank you. D? So we say there's case law about that, that local preference being invalid. And I think probably we get away with some of it uh, on, on the local level if it's not big enough to challenge. Uh, there's all sorts of factors. So that has another part to that. It's not open ended if you want to say a municipal level. Um, and then I can't forget, I forget the other points. So. Well, so far, but, but we, DAC, uh, the evaluation committee can say we want only local artists. I don't know whether we have that in our code because I haven't worked with that problem, but again, at a certain point, that could be challenged. Maybe, thanks. Um, so we've set up another working group on the heels of what we just passed um, with the public curators and local artists to deal with some of the transparency implementation issues and to explore the local proposition if it is or isn't allowed or if it could simply be a factor in certain instances. So and I am I am the current only member, so if anyone would like to join me, you are welcome to. Thank you. <laughs> Can I just say, Nick, we have all sorts of bills and stuff on local preference and that we should be able to okay. roll in. So for the legal part of that. Quincy's looped in right now because okay. she volunteered. Okay. Well, um, she's but always been our 1%. Okay, okay. awesome. So cool. she knows the whole district that, that she could draw on her. Okay, great. Oh, I know and what I agree with this. That, 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 that uh, the Department of Law gets involved in contracts upon request of purchasing for the department. And so once I have, you know, the identification issues are, so we're pulled into, and I can't remember, I think one year we reviewed either 700 or 7,000 contracts with some amazing amount, but we were calling for specific issues generally. Generally we will involve the Department of Law and IT, ITD on software contracts because the whole IT purchasing is a whole other world. And like I say, we get, uh, D and IT involved in those extensively. Okay, but uh, just since we have time, you didn't really get into this, but um, uh, there's a like appeal process too. Yes, there is an appeal process called the Bidding Review Board, uh, and it, the way it's very short portion of the code that basically says anybody that's a, an aggrieved party, I think it's not even an aggrieved party. Any person adversely affected by an award of a municipal contract may appeal to either the assembly or the mayor, or the bidding review board. And then the, what the bidding review board does is they, first of all, the way the process works, we encourage people to send the, 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 their appeal to the purchasing office for us to look at it and determine, make an evaluation whether we should recommend Convening the bidding review board or not, uh, <coughs> and then uh, if the bidding review board is convened, they come in, they look at the entire documentation and make a determination. Did the purchasing department follow pro follow the process outlined in the code? And if and then they come back with a, a recommendation to the assembly. Okay. I think I've seen one. In my time. There, it's been a couple of years since we've had. 
Uh, Meg? Uh, this question for D. Um, that any person aggrieved, that doesn't convey some kind of taxpayer standing, does it? I don't think it hasn't come up. It hasn't come up. Okay. I could see some individuals utilizing that. So, okay. Thanks. The code is very broad in that. Hmm. Yeah. In that. And we have not had It's always been contractors. Okay. Move on? Yep. Okay, the other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, proprietary and non-competitive procurements. Sometimes they're referred to as sole source. Uh, I'm required to come to the assembly for approval for anything over $30,000 or $50,000 if it's a cooperative agreement. And by that I mean we're piggybacking on a contract that somebody else has awarded. Uh, and the, the code says, you know, we say sole source, but what the code actually says is does it reasonably limit <clears throat> the source to one person? And by person, it's meant person or, or company. So that reasonably limit gives a little bit of flexibility uh, to the assembly and uh, to me for those small dollar procurements. If it is going to be a sole source proprietary contract, it must be in writing. Otherwise, I require the departments to send me a memo telling me why it reasonably limits the source to one one firm, and then I can either approve it or disapprove it, and I have kicked a number of them back. Or else, if it's over $30,000 or 50, we're gonna to come to the assembly. And this is on initial awards, I'm not talking about change orders. Now. Change orders are a whole different section of the code. So then that's when you will see those procurements, uh, those AMs come to you asking for either a sole source award or a proprietary award. Uh, and sometimes you'll see that the initial award is only $14,000 because the way the code is now written is they look at the total anticipated dollar value of the contract. So if I have a contract with options, I have to include the options even though the initial award is under $30,000. That's why you'll see in the introductory paragraph, sometimes you'll see $14,000 because that's all I'm initially awarding. And then when you read through the rest of the document, you'll see the other two or three options, depending upon how many it is. Do we have a question? Yeah, I have a few questions for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have two questions. One is broad and one is specific. To what degree does sort of continuity drive the sole source decision? That is, you know, sometimes it seems like, well, we've been using this, this contractor and it would cost us quite a lot to switch over to this other system. Let's say something, there's compatibility issues or what have you. But over the long term, if we did make this switch, perhaps it's a superior product. So what's the time horizon that you look at for the municipality? And to what degree, again, to restate what I said, to what degree does continuity drive the sole source decision? Difficult, it's a great question, difficult question to ask of each other. It's very subjective. At least in my view, I will look out generally two or three years to see does it make sense to continue this because I can see there's a new technology on the horizon, yeah. or there's an existing technology that if we bite the bullet now, it's going to pay us. Uh, look at those on a case by case basis. You said two, so two to three years. That is a long time horizon for some small businesses or individuals, but that's a pretty short time horizon. If we look at ten. 20, 50 years in some cases, right? So, I mean, do you ever look out that far? In the past, I have not, because most of the sole sources that have come to me have been um, either on IT products, or it could be on, uh, we, we see a lot on, uh, on fleet right now, because best practices has been to standardize within a fleet. Yeah. So, those, to me, makes sense. Standardization makes sense because that's going to save money in the long run. Um, well, maybe, right? I mean, I, it, it, it saves us money in the long run if we have made the right choice, if, right? So we're using Ford. If GM or Toyota or whatever it is becomes significantly superior in the next few years, then we've made the wrong choice. So, I mean, I guess there's no easy answer, but you're telling me it's basically case by case and we rely on your judgment. Yeah. That's it, and then rely on the assembly when we come to come to you for those approvals yeah. to question us. Uh, question the department, question us about does this make sense and why? 
can, can I ask my specific question, Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair? Thank you. So we had a couple years ago, I remember it being discussed in the assembly meeting. We haven't discussed it in a while. And that had to do with playground equipment. Mm -hmm. we, we made pretty significant sole source. We have in the past at least made pretty significant sole source uh, decisions with regard to playground equipment which seems a little bit counterintuitive, right? I mean, it seems like there's a, there would be a lot of playground equipment companies. And I know we've been, we've been a national leader when it comes to inclusive play, right? Is it still the case that we think there's really only one company that can provide that for us? Or um, is it my, or is it the Parks Foundation that's driving that decision? I, sh I mean, I should know that I'm on the board, but I'm curious to hear what your thoughts are on that. My thoughts on that is I own, when those originally started coming through, John, Rod, and I had a number of different conversations about that, those particular equipment. And John convinced me that this is the best thing because they had done their market research, they had done their studies to determine that this met our requirements and was a playground equipment that would last. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case though? I mean, we were a national leader in inclusive play, but now are there other places, are there other companies that are providing that kind of product? I have not seen any of those in probably six to nine months. Those contracts you Right, made? those new, new playground equipment. Doesn't say I won't see one tomorrow. Okay. Uh, but I, I don't recall seeing any of them in six to nine months. Okay. The other one where we made that decision was on field turf, the particular right. type of turf that was. And that was a, a standardization of best practices because it works. And it's all through the school district and the municipality. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Soul sources are a, are a <coughs> great topic, difficult uh, decisions to make sometimes because they are case-by-case -case basis and subjective. And that's why I encourage you, when you see those, look hard at them. Austin. Yeah, thanks, Felix. Um, you said the cooperative purchase piggybacks on another yes, award. What, what do you mean? What a cooperative purchase is, is uh, <clears throat> maybe the school district, well, I'll give you an example, Vera. The school district uh, was the leader in contracting for Vera. And so uh, instead of me going out and doing a recompetition, I talked to the school district and said, can I piggyback on your contract? Oh, is I don't have to go through the competitive process. <clears throat> You've already done that. So can I write uh, a contract with Vera based on your terms and conditions of their and school district? For an additional contract. Yes, for a new contract. Because we have a separate you know, school district has their contract with Vera. We have our contract with, with Vera. But we can use each other's contracts. And then that would come to us because it's over the 50K. Yes, ma'am. Another example is vehicles. Sourcewell, who is a national cooperative agency, they do this. Uh, they have competed. Some contracts, sometimes when we look deep into them, sometimes they haven't competed. That's why sometimes you'll see a sole source, and then down on the body, it will say we're using a contract from Sourcewell because they actually went out and negotiated terms and conditions. Thank you. Thank you. Meg? Thank you. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, one, um, you said question us when we get these, um, and I find there's a, a difference of quality among sole source contracts that come before us. APT, APD ones, we usually have great justification, a lot of information. I still have a lot of, really, a lot of heartburn around the Beans Emergency Shelter sole source contract. <coughs> um, we didn't have any information. We didn't even have a justification about why it was sole source. Um, but if the departments are charged with providing a justification, shouldn't that just come to us automatically? It, we will, when we get the determination from the department, we will attach that to the AM. We try, when purchasing gets those, we try and look at them hard to make sure they make sense and that they justify the sole source. And uh, as you say, some departments are better writers than others. And that's why you'll see our AM sometimes a little and sometimes a lot different than uh, the accompanying document because we're going to try and add additional information to help you make that decision. Staying on that example, that particular AM actually didn't have your involvement. Um, I didn't see your name in the list of names because I look for those things. Oh, um, so why, why might that have been? That particular purchase that you're talking about was originally started as a lease 
and Robin Ward in the real estate department uh, is charged with doing leases. So that started with a lease. Robin was working that, and then it morphed into a contract. And Robin and I had a long discussion about why she didn't stop and get purchasing involved at that point. And that was just, uh, I'll say, an error that we didn't get involved until after the fact. Okay, that helps clear up some information for me. Thank you. Thank you. Fred? Yeah, so thinking particularly of the UTL monies, some of those have very high cost equipment, right? The power generators. Some of them are really old. And at some point, there's a crossover part in place. You know, when you go to new technology, Are those departments equipped to do that kind of economic analysis for them? You know, what the maintenance pass, restoration, new, new equipment, or they get you into it? They get us involved with it because if they don't, we're going to question them and try and make them do that analysis or else say, look, if you don't have the expertise, let's contract the expertise. Let's go find it. Okay, good on you. Thank you. They suspect the playground equipment. We now are trying to figure out stuff that the damn vandals can't burn down. <laughs> That's part of it, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Forrest. Oh, um, is that really you? No, I had a quick bit that it was answered. So okay. no, thank you. Um, the, uh, this is actually not just for sole source, but it's something I've encountered on my private sector side. Are we part of any group purchasing organizations? Yes. Which we we have the ability to use the way our code is written any cooperative agreement. So we go out and look for them. And, and we do. We're part of some of the big national. Yes, uh, Houston, Galveston. And what do we HGAC. use? What, what kind of things do we purchase through those? Uh, from HGAC, we will generally purchase uh, uh, fire apparatus. Oh really? Yes. Oh great. Good. That's how we ended up with our big uh, the two. I forgot what to go. The big ladder truck. Thanks. And then we will use cooperative agreements to buy police interceptors also. We'll try and piggyback either on a state on a state contract if they've got what we want or we'll try and find another one. So and you consider, you consider we'll repeated. participation in, in a GPO to be a kind of cooperative purchase? Yes. Okay, interesting. Thank you, Mr. Chief. Thank you. Fred? Yeah, I think you and your predecessor have tried to evaluate what level of stuff on the consent agenda do, should we be appropriately taking time with? Not really me, but yes, my predecessor <laughs> and others. Yeah, and yeah. it's a very valid one. That was and at some point in some venue, I'd like your counsel on that. We have, just so you know, wait for you. Yeah, and I think Dee can answer that question. Well, we're, the Austin and I have been working on that together for years. Sure. I was just going to assure you that uh, uh, purchasing treats uh, sole source, there's almost a presumption against them. And we go through the mill to get that permission. And sole source members have rejected premium teams. Um, uh, and there is a, a, a quality of writer issue for some of the departments. Um, so that's one thing. And I just wanted to say to Forrest is that uh, playground thing, one of the re basis of the sole source was that all the bunch of community councils had met and wanted this particular vendor. And I think that was sort of the tipping point too, and then the, the, the assembly just exploded on that whole issue. But that was sort of an interesting thing, was that the, the community councils had done all this work and were in favor of this particular vendor. Thank you. Uh, Forrest? That's interesting. I think if there was, what you just said, it really struck me, that there's a bunch that are put forward that are rejected. If there's more some way for you to report that to us, not every time it's rejected, but some kind of like, because that's a piece of information I didn't have, but I think that would help relieve some of the heartburn over the sole source if we knew, because what it looks like from our perspective, we only see the ones you approve. So it seems like there's a slew of sole source and it's just like you guys just do a willy-nilly, to be honest. Um, maybe not completely willy-nilly, but we see a lot of sole source. So if there was some way to report to us, here are all the times we've rejected, I think that would work out. Give an example, I rejected one out of uh, economic community development uh, two days ago. It was for $29,000 to buy some point of sale machines over at the uh, Denina. And I said, wait a minute, we, I need better justification before I can approve this. And those that are at the cusp of where 
uh, it should come to the assembly or it may not. Yeah, I, I look really hard at those. And I'm not asking you like humiliate the department. Oh, no, I wouldn't. But like there was some broad overview you could give us periodically. Like here, here are like the several dozen that we rejected in the last six month period or whatever. I would, I would like to see that. I think there are very there are some black and white ones like that where they're just rejected. There's no way of coming back. But Ron makes most of the students come up with better justification. So second and third sole source metal mm -hmm. is enough. But I'm not sure how we report or by the way to be three times through the mill. I have a special pair of begging shoes that I wear right now. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Uh, Pete? Thank you. And just for informational purposes, when when I was first on the agenda uh, on the assembly we, we didn't get those, uh, uh, you know, sole source listed separately on our assembly report. We actually uh, passed a resolution that, that they provide that information at least once a month to us so, so that we'd be able to review that. Otherwise, we were having to sort of chase it down one item at a time. And, and so we, it's, it's, it's much more uh, easy to track and, much more public information available than they used to be on that. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, just the last thing is on the consent agenda, this is where you're going to see 9C is where you're going to see the invitation to bids, and 9 Delta is where you're going to see the sole source request, and uh, as it stands right now, the RFP awards. So that's where you'll see those particular documents. All right. And Thank then you. Last thing was any additional questions or uh, comments from the deep? In terms of Nate's question about the temporal thing, um, if, if a contract is subject to assembly approval, not just a reporting requirement, so it's a six hundred thousand dollars or something, we can't enter into a contract. We can't have a signed contract prior to your approval, and they're supposed to give you in the AM the material terms of the contract. Uh, so that's that's all of these things. And so that was beans. Beans, uh, we, you know, theoretically material terms should be in the AM. Um, but we, we could not have a signed contract. Can I, ask can I tag on for a second? Sure. And the other thing is, <clears throat> I don't, on Tuesday night, once you approve it, I don't award the contract <coughs> until two days later because that gives you time for reconsideration. So if, if you approve a contract on Tuesday, that contract's not going to be awarded to leave it Thursday or Friday. Mm -hmm. I, I realize we're over, so I'll, I'll actually just offline. I mean, I really want to talk a little bit more about what material terms means, because one of the things with beads, um, I'll start out there because I just want to think about it, is that we per they purchase bunk beds, but they've also said they don't want to be in the business of sheltering anymore, and so I'm having a lot of heartburn about that. And we did learn, I did learn through Robin, that half of them probably won't be usable after the term, but it seems to be like, I could see where we could get in a position as a muni of purchasing the, those bulk beds from them and we've like paid twice potentially for them. It's just, so I really want to dig into this material terms, but we can do that another time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Did you? No? Okay. Thank you so much. All right.